Gentlemen, what is going on today? My name is Ryan Mickler. I am the host and the founder of the Order of Man podcast and movement. Today is your Ask Me Anything. Uh, we've got some great questions, fielding those questions from uh, our members of our exclusive brotherhood called the Iron Council. So if you're just joining the Order of Man podcast and movement, the Iron Council is uh, a brotherhood of almost 1,000 men now, all designed to equip you with the tools and conversations and resources and accountability and camaraderie that you need to thrive as a man. None of this lone wolf stuff, uh, working together side by side, shoulder to shoulder with other men who are on very similar paths as you, some a little further down the road, some a little further back, but all walking again, shoulder to shoulder to help each other become the best fathers, husbands, business owners, community leaders, whatever facet, uh, uh, faculty of life you're showing up as. So if you're interested in the Iron Council, check it out at orderofman.com slash Iron Council. Guys, normally I do this Ask Me Anything with my co-host Kip Sorensen. Uh, a little different today. He's uh, taking care of some things because I'm recording this on Labor Day. Uh, so he's, he's laboring, I believe, uh, at his, uh, his uh, lake, lake property. They're doing some work out there. So Messaged me and said, hey, you're riding solo on this one, which I'm, I'm fine with. We can do that. Uh, for better or worse, you're going to have to listen to this one. <laughs> so uh, before I get into it, just want to make a quick mention. Uh, it's starting to cool off here in Maine, which is where I live and where our headquarters are. Uh, I've got some friends over at Origin, Maine that are making some incredible, incredible durable goods, all 100% made and sourced in America. These are geese and rash guards for jujitsu, but they've branched into uh, multiple different types of denim. Uh, also into boots. I have my, uh, my bison boots on right now. As a matter of fact, I think it's the first time that I've put them on uh, since summer uh, because we're starting to get into fall here, but they also have a new product you need to check out and it launches this week. It's called the heavy hoodie. And I know Pete, the founder of origin has been uh, thinking, planning, strategizing, and then putting all the pieces in place for this particular hoodie for years now. And you might think, well, what's different about this? Well, the fact that it's 100% made and sourced in America, but it's got a lot of unique uh, little things, features uh, that aren't available with a, with a normal hoodie. Number one, it's heavier. It's a lot heavier uh, material. So definitely going to keep you warmer, especially if you're in your cold weather places like uh, we are here in Maine. Uh, it's got a nice zip pocket and the uh, instead of a drawstring, it's got snaps. So it's uh, pretty unique. I think you guys are going to like it. Check it out. You can check that out at originmaine.com originmain.com and use the code order at checkout. You'll save some money O R D E R at checkout. All right, guys, let's get into these questions. Again, we're fielding them from our exclusive brotherhood, the iron council order slash iron council. Uh, let's kick things off with Dylan Robinson. Uh, he says, how do you be present and honest with yourself? In other words, how to quote unquote, keep your world small. Well, I mean, this is crucial, right? Being present and honest with yourself because it's very easy uh, for us to convince ourselves that the way we're thinking about ideas and, and challenges and strategies and solutions is all accurate and correct. And I'm, I'm probably more guilty of this than anybody else because, you know, I think my way is right. I tend to be pretty stubborn. Uh, tend to have uh, an opinion about everything and never at a lack or loss of being able or having the desire to share it. So uh, this, this concept of being present and honest with yourself can actually be a challenge because it's very easy to put ourselves into these echo chambers where we're sharing things and we're only surrounding ourselves with information, people, sources, news outlets, et cetera, et cetera, that are going to just reaffirm our, our, our world beliefs. So for me, being honest with yourself, being present with yourself is a couple of different things. Number one, doing an after action review uh, and, and really analyzing how you're behaving, how you're thinking, how you're processing, how you're taking action every single day. And this is not just to pat yourself on the back, but this is also to critically analyze where you're falling short, where you're struggling, where you need to do better, how exactly you're going to do better, and then start formulating little micro strategies for improvement tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day and so on. Uh, number two is I think this really is going to help if you can learn to be more humble. Humility is really, really going to 
Actually, let me say it this way. Getting rid of the ego, and, and maybe that's humility, or maybe it's just knocking down the ego and not believing that your success is just linked with being the best, always performing at 100%, always performing as a master, and instead let the ego go and realize that you need to fail, you need to flounder, you need to struggle, you need to thrust yourself into new environments and situations and circumstances that are uncomfortable. Jiu-jitsu is one we talk about all the time. It's a great uh, example of that. Uh, or asking powerful questions or having conversations that are risky or um, speaking in front of people or on stage. Like These are all things that you can do that you're going to really struggle with initially. I know I do. Uh, but that struggle is a pretty good indicator that you're uncomfortable and that it might be moving you towards, uh, towards a better solution. And then the third thing I would say, so again, we have after act action review, we have humility, the mindset of humility or letting go of the ego. And then the third is making sure that you're surrounding yourself with sources you aren't used to surrounding yourself by and trying not to come up with any sort of, uh, defense mechanism or rationalization or justification about why these individuals are wrong, but just entertaining the idea, right? I can't remember who said it, but they said the it's a sign of intelligence and I'm paraphrasing here, and I'm also going to butcher it to be able to uh, entertain an idea without accepting it or embracing it, something along those lines. And uh, I, I think all too often, if we hear conflicting advice or ideas with our own personal ideology or worldview that we're so quick to just brush it off, to dismiss it, to mock it, to ridicule it, to say anybody who would think like that is stupid. And I, I don't really think that's generally the case. Uh, instead, what I would challenge you to do, and I challenge myself to do this, although I'm still working towards it, uh, is, is just entertaining the idea. Well, let, let me listen to this. Let, let me consider it. What, what would happen if this played out? Why does this person believe that? Or in what situation does this work? And so really, in a way, red, red teaming. We've talked about that in the past. Uh, these ideas and concepts without any preconceived notion and letting go of the pre preconceived notion and just asking yourself what would happen if this idea played out. Uh, it's going to make you a more well-rounded individual, more intelligent, and only one of two things is going to happen. You're either going to solidify your current perspective, which is fine if you feel like that's the outlet or the, or the correct path, uh, or you'll learn new information that's going to cause you to move and act and behave differently moving forward, which is also good. If you have a new perspective and it causes you to change your environment or to perform better, then that's, that's a win. So you're always going to win if you do it that way. So hope that helps, uh, Dylan. Number two, this one comes from my good friend, Ron Christopher. Uh, he says this is for Ryan, which is good. He didn't know it was just going to be me today. He thought it was going to be Kip and I. So this is for me. Good, because I'm here. He says, do you ever wonder if you are taking things or excuse me, taking everything too seriously? I feel like I am not laughing enough, although I am killing it in all areas. Ron, I got to tell you, man, I actually feel very much the same way. Uh, I'm a serious person by nature. So I think if I'm going to err uh, in my seriousness versus silliness spectrum, <laughs> it's probably going to err on the side of being serious, being dedicated, being committed, being all in, taking things seriously, like moving forward in the right direction. And this is definitely a personality issue. And, and I don't think issue is probably not the right word because it's not wrong, right? You've got people who are funny. You've got people who are serious. You've got people who are both. You've got people who are on one complete end or opposite or extreme of the other. And it's not wrong. Uh, but I do want to smile. I do want to laugh. I do want to enjoy. I do want to at times soak life in and not be so serious about moving forward through my task list or completing all of my objectives, which is funny because this morning I spent about 20 or 30 minutes working with my battle planner and actually going through and figuring out what I needed to get accomplished today. And I derive a, a tremendous sense of satisfaction and value and fulfillment from getting my shit done. So I like being serious, but if you're feeling like you're too serious, I would ask yourself and I'm, I'm needing to ask myself these questions as well is what, what makes you smile? When, when do you just relax and enjoy? When's the last time you really laughed? And I'm talking like a belly laugh and just enjoyed. When's the last time you were silly with your kids 
uh, or you got on the dance floor with your wife, or you did something that you've never done before. Um, and also that you do things that are just intrinsically valuable as a hard charger and a high achiever and a, uh, a, a list checker offer, I would say somebody who just wants to check off the list. Sometimes we only do things that are going to quote unquote, move the needle. Uh, and instead of it being that maybe there's value in just doing things for the sake of doing them, going to the lake, for example, are you checking off a box? I mean, maybe you're developing and nurturing relationships with your friends or your family, but you're just there and you're present in the moment. And I think that level of presence and just doing it because it's intrinsically valuable, not because you're checking it off a list uh, is, is really going to help you lighten up, loosen up a little bit and enjoy life in a just as fulfilling, rewarding way from a different perspective. Hope that helps, Ron. You and me are in the same boat on that one. So um, there you go. All right, Bobby Katie says, for both of you, he's talking about Kip and, and myself. Uh, he says, who do you look uh, up to for inspiration or mentorship? And what are my current goals? Well, as far as who I look up to for, for inspiration and motivation and all that kind of stuff, I mean, you go, go, through, go through my, the, my guests on the podcast. I mean, we've had some phenomenal, phenomenal guests over the past six years, and these are all individuals that I reached out to, that I deliberately and intentionally connected with, because these are guys I wanted to have conversations with. In fact, when I started Order of Man, really one of the goals was to be able to have conversations with people I admired, people I respected, people that uh, I felt had some value to offer, uh, guys who were succeeding in one or more areas of life. And so I reached out to these individuals and uh, that, that's why I have them on the podcast. So if you ever are curious about where I turn to for inspiration, just go look at the list uh, of podcast guests and you can know that we've had guys like John Eldridge and James Clear, uh, Mark Manson. We've had Andy Frasilla. We've had Sean Whalen. We've had Ed Milet. We've had Dakota Meyer, Jocko, Pete Roberts, Tim Kennedy, uh, Kyle Carpenter, Andy Stumpf. I mean, the, the guys who I look to, it's all listed right out there for you. So if you're wondering where I go to look for inspiration, that's where I go. But I also get inspiration from you and other guys in the Iron Council and people who I interact with on social media. I feel like everybody has something to share. And it's my job as the person interacting with individuals to extract the value that they bring to the table. And sometimes that's readily apparent. And other times you have to dig a little bit, but everybody has something valuable to share. Uh, even the guy on the, you know, the street corner uh, asking for money, there's, there's some value there. There's some lessons there that you can extract, that you can learn from, and that you can improve and get better in, in any environment or circumstance or situation you find yourself in. So look for it. If you're looking for it, you'll find it. But if you want to know who I turn to for inspiration and motivation, you've got a lineup of 300 plus guests at this point, And I turned to all of them. Uh, as far as goals, what do, what do I, what do I have that I want to achieve? Well, obviously I want to continue to grow order of man. It's very important. And for the next 90 days, I'm very, very focused on running uh, successful events. We just got done with our first wedding here at our property in Maine. Uh, and then we have our father son event. We've got our main event. Uh, and then we've got in the spring, we've got another event with Bejos Kulian out of California, who's coming here to Maine to run one of his Squire programs uh, uh, here in Maine. So yeah, that's the big focus for me right now. Um, outside of that, I've got some hunting goals because I've got about three hunts in the next 90 to 120 days. So I'm planning and preparing and getting ready for those things. And uh, so those are, those are the two biggest goals on my mind right now. And by the way, if you're curious about goal setting and how we do it here, how I do it personally, and how thousands of other men have done it, then go to orderaman.com slash battle ready, orderaman.com slash battle ready. And you can go through a series of emails over 30 days that are going to get you geared up for creating your own goals and making the last three to four months of this year, the most uh, successful for you, whatever that looks like. This is from Bill Patton. He says, what tips can you provide for uprooting the family to a new state? This is one that I get quite a bit because uh, many of you know, two years ago, a little over two years now, uh, my wife and I uprooted uh, our family 
and uh, of course our four children with that and moved from Southern Utah to rural Maine. Uh, and it was, it was a big challenge and there was a lot of concerns and questions and uh, hesitancy and is this going to work and doubt and fear and uncertainty and all of that stuff. Uh, but I'm happy to announce that over the past two years, it's been one of the best decisions that we've ever made. Uh, and, and I wish I had some, some perfect formula for you to, you know, do these 10 things when moving across the country. I, I don't really know if it's that uh, I tend to be pretty intuitive in nature. And so I don't need to get into like, well, it's the one through 10. It's just, does this feel right? Yes, it feels right. Good. Go. And we'll figure it out along the way. It's always been my personality. Uh, so what would I say though? I, I would say, obviously know w- where you're moving, know what the culture's like. Uh, Try to meet people as quickly as you possibly can. Know that this is important, uh, that it's not the new community or neighborhood's obligation to welcome you and embrace you in the fold. It's your responsibility to put yourself in in the environment, put yourself out there. And I feel like my wife and I, over the past a little over two years now, have done a very good job entrenching ourselves in the community. But that wasn't because everybody you know rushed to to welcome us with open arms. We had. Pete Roberts and Amanda Roberts, his wife, who of course did, and other friends who were very welcoming and we've made friends and neighbors and things like that. But we also got involved. And and if there's one thing I could tell you that you need to do is to get involved, get involved in church, get involved in, if your kids are going to school, get involved in their, uh, their, their schooling or their PTA meetings or their school board meetings, get involved in sports. If you have kids, again, you're talking about moving a family, then uh, volunteer to coach youth sports. You'll meet other men. You'll meet dads who are somewhat probably like-minded to you, um, but get involved, uh, go to the gym, train jujitsu. You're going to find other guys there. The more that you can personally do to get involved in the community, the more successful you're going to be. Uh, and then also remember with kids, uh, that they're going to have a challenge. They're leaving friends. It's, it's, I think it's more easy for, uh, adults to manage, leaving friends because they realize that that's the sacrifice that might need to be made to go on this adventure to have this experience. But kids don't quite fully understand that. Mine didn't. Uh, So we're, we're very uh, aware of the conversations that we have and how are you feeling about things? And are you liking things and what don't you like? And how can we create a better experience? And we're looking for ways of course, to serve our children too, so that they uh, make the most of this, this time that we have here however long it may be. Okay. Hope that helps, man. And good luck. If you have any more questions, let me know, Bill. All right. This one comes from Tyson Yonkers. He says he just uh, finished up the four agreements. And by the way, the four agreements uh, is the book that we're reading for the month of September in the Iron Council. And we're focusing on creating your new reality, creating your new reality. Uh, And uh, so again, the four agreements is the book. He said, it made me think of something I see a lot in the Iron Council. How would you recommend turning a daily objective like, quote, following the four agreements into a tangible task that you know you're making progress in? So this goes back to the question about goal setting. Uh, a lot of people, when they set goals, what men will do is they're very, they're very generic. They're, 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 they're worthy goals. They're, they're worthy of, of aspiring to but they're so generic that it would be very easy for anybody to just kind of like waffle through it. So like, for example, he's saying, how do you, how do you turn something like, fo- I want to follow the four agreements into a tangible objective? Cause that's what you need to do. Like if, if, if you said, I'm, I'm going to go run a race and I'm going to win. Well, and that's all you said, like, what are you, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about a 50 yard sprint? Are we talking about an 800 meter run? Are we talking about doing a marathon or a half marathon or even an ultra endurance event? Like what exactly are we talking about? Because if you're saying, Hey, I'm going to beat you from here to here and that's 10 feet away. Like, okay, well that's actually measurable or, Hey, I'm going to beat you in a, uh, you know, a marathon. Okay. 26 miles. That's, that's measurable. So it has to be something that you can quantify. Otherwise, how do you know if you're moving the needle? So if you take the four agreements, one of the agreements is to be impeccable with your word. What I would personally do is I would say, okay, if, if, if this is my focus, that I want to learn to better become impeccable with my word, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to break that down and I'm going to do an after action review at the end of every day. And I'm going to go through all of the commitments I made, 
all of the requests that I received, all the conversations that I had, and I'm going to write down what I said I would do. I said I would do this podcast or have this conversation or help this buddy move or uh, you know, give to this charitable organization. Like These are all the things I committed to. And at the end of the day, you look at it and say, okay, well, which did I do and which didn't I do? And the which did you do, you check off the list. And the which didn't you do, you make a plan for doing it the very next day. And if you did that every single day for 30 or 60 or 90 days, you can see how you would actually be moving the needle towards being impeccable with your word. Now it's just not up for interpretation. It's, it's quantifiable. Did I do that after action review every single day so that I could achieve ultimately what I want to achieve? But I don't know that, uh, and I'm going to back up here. I don't know that having an objective like following the four agreements is really a goal anyways. I would say that's more of a tactic. Like why? Why do you want to follow the four agreements? Well, because I want to build a, a deeper relationship with my wife. Got it. Okay, that's the goal, right? You want to have a deeper relationship with your wife and you're going to utilize the four agreements in order to achieve that. Or you want to become a more confident man. Okay, got it. That's the goal and the tactic, the way that you're going to do it is to not take things personally, to be impeccable with your word, to actually follow the four agreements. And if you do that, then you're confident that you're going to be a more confident man in 90 days or so. So again, don't confuse tactic with objective. Okay, the, you have three main components of this. You have your vision, which is, I would say, really your your why it's more, it's more closely linked with your why, like, why do you want, I want to become a good man. I want to be the best father that I can be. It's like grounded in the why, like what really drives you and, 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 and keeps you going. That's the vision. Next, you have your objective. The objective is the what, right? So what exactly need, do I need to do? Like, what is it that I'm reaching towards? Uh, if, if it's, I want to secure a promotion in 90 days, that's a good objective. That's a worthy objective. It's the what secure a promotion. Uh, I want to, uh, salvage my marriage. Good. That's the, what that's exactly what you want to accomplish. I want to be more deeply connected with my kids. Uh, I want to lose uh, 50 pounds. You can see what I'm saying here. These are the objectives. That's the, what, so we have the, why is the vision? The, what is the objective? And then you have the, how that's the tactic. So if the what is I want to be more connected with my wife and salvage our relationship, then the tactic is the how. How am I going to do that? I'm going to follow the four agreements. I'm going to let her know I appreciate her. I'm going to take her on a date night each and every week. We're going to do a evening or I should say a daily conversation. I'm going to leave a little note or shoot her a text in the middle of the day and tell her I appreciate her. These are all tactics. These are strategies. This is the how you're going to accomplish the task, the what which is going to move you towards your ultimate why, which is the vision that you have for yourself. It's a lot of words in there. So they're not big words, but there's a lot of words I just rambled off. So if you need to like hit pause and go back and listen to that, it's very, very important. The why, the what, and the how. Hope that helps, Tyson. All right, let's go to Roger Taylor from Team Atomic. He says, are there any activities or exercises uh, that you practice in order to become more resilient mentally or emotionally in pre uh, preparation for future challenges. Yeah. You know, I, there's one right offhand that comes to mind that you guys are probably sick of hearing me talk about, and that's jujitsu. That's, that's actually challenged me. Yes. Physically. Sure. But also mentally and emotionally, because you have bad days, you have hard days. There's days you don't feel like training that you just get up in the morning uh, and you go do it anyways, because you want to be impeccable with your word, which we just talked about from the four agreements. So yeah, there's, there's, there's one right there. And I do that four to five days per week, even when I don't feel like it and the lessons that I learn and how I feel about myself, the confidence I develop, the assertiveness that I have, the way that I can begin to look at situations and angles and perspectives that I couldn't previously jujitsu has been a big help for that. So yes, it's more physical in nature to the casual observer, but underneath the surface is this real 
mental and emotional challenge. Kip, Kip actually talked about it as a mental battle. Uh, for those of you who are following along, Kip just got his black belt. Uh, and I was going to ask him today, if he joined us, I was going to ask him if he, you know, how he's, how he's been feeling over the past, you know, week and a half to two weeks since getting his black belt, if he's, you know, been securing promotions and, uh, having to ward off the advancements of beautiful women just because he has black belt. So I was going to ask him that we'll have to ask him next week, but, uh, he did also talk about the mental battle that it's been over the 10 plus years that he's been training. So that's personally what I do. And then I do that after action review to get a real objective look at how I'm performing, where I'm doing well, and also where I'm falling short. And that's important that you analyze that too. Eric Gentry says, uh, what are your strategies for instilling self-confidence in your kids? Yeah, I really like this question, instilling self-confidence in your kids. Here's what I would say, just generally, and then we can work backwards into this a little bit. The way that any person develops confidence is by doing things that he did not previously think himself capable of doing. That's how. Period. Bottom line. End of story. Anything else is not confidence. It might be bravado or f false machismo or uh, just, just arrogance or excessive pride. Notice I say excessive because you should be proud about things, um, not everything but you should be proud of your, your achievements and the things you're doing well. But if it gets in excess, it becomes an issue. Uh, but confidence, on the other hand, is something that's, that's earned. Like you went to battle. You had to, you had to speak in public. Uh, you had to share an opinion or a perspective that you thought you know, wasn't well-liked well or wouldn't be well-received, and yet you still had to share it because you had an obligation or responsibility to do it. Or you made a commitment to go to gym, the gym, and so you're, you're going to do it because you committed to doing it. And so these are all exercises uh, and strategies for how you personally can develop confidence in yourself. Now, I know your question was, how do you instill this in your children? It's the exact same way. No, if you want confidence in your children, then they're going to have to battle with things and overcome things that they didn't previously think themselves capable of. These can be minor things, by the way, like clean your room. No, what child wants to clean their room? But if you give them the assignment and you say, I need you to clean your room and here's the standard that I expect and here's when it needs to be done by and they go and they clean it and they're going to gripe and they're going to moan and complain because that's what kids do and they don't want to clean their room. And I get it. Who wants to clean their room? But this is what you have them do. At the end, I promise you, regardless of how they felt when they do it, their head's going to be a little higher. Their shoulders are going to be a little further back. Their chest is going to be propped out a little bit because they feel good about getting something done. Something as simple as cleaning the room. Or here's another one, very small, is one thing that uh, we have a rule in our house that when we sit down at the dinner table and there's something new, maybe it's a new fruit or a new dish or a new this or a new that, our kids have to try it. They have to try it. They don't have to like it. They don't have to enjoy it. They don't have to eat all of it a lot of the times, but we do require that they try it. And we just built a phrase around this. We try new things. Mickler tried new things. We try new things. That's what we do. And it's funny because, you know, every once in a while, they'll get like the pickles out. And I'm like, I'm not eating that pickle. And my kids will say, well, dad, we're, we try things. We try new things. I'm like, well, I've had a pickle before, but they still try to use that against me. Um, but the reason I bring that up is because even though they may not like, like we had mango the other day and my youngest was like, I don't want to eat that. I'm like, you, a mango? Like you, you've never eaten a mango. Hey, that's weird. But also like it's a mango. It's delicious. And he didn't want to eat it. But we said, hey, Mickler's try, try new things. So he did and he ate the mango. Um, and, you know, he didn't totally like it, but I think he was just trying to play it off because he didn't want to be wrong because that's his personality. Probably gets that from his mom. Definitely not me. Uh, and, uh, but anyways, he, he built up a little confidence because even though he didn't like it, I'm like, cool, at least you tried it. And that was it. And he built up confidence because he did something that he didn't want to do. Uh, and he did it anyways. And that's how you develop confidence in kids. Now, this could also work in more meaningful scenarios like, hey, I, I need you to take on a, a, a specific task. I need you to accomplish this thing around the house. Um, I, I know you just started baseball and you're not really enjoying it, uh, but you need to finish. Or I know you really want to get that starting catching position. And so you and I are going to work on getting 
the drills and the fundamentals and the throwing and everything right so that you can earn that starting position. And then you do it and your son or daughter, they get better and they improve and they earn their starting position and they're going to feel better about it. But what does not develop confidence is not pushing on them at all. So th this is, I think, more of the, the, the wokeness, the helicopter parenting, the, what I've dubbed the doctrine of popular culture, where we really try to create these environments for our kids where they don't feel any sort of hardship or challenge or struggle or awkwardness or discomfort. Uh, and, and it's just not helpful. Like if you're just sheltering your kids from anything that's hard, whether it's trying new food, eating your spinach to, Hey, you said you're going to be on the baseball team and you don't like it, but you got to finish out the year because you made a commitment to doing it. And wherever it might fall on that, that range of things it could be, they have to be in difficult and uncomfortable situations. And your job is not to shelter them from it. Your job is to expose them to those things in controlled environments and then make sure they follow through with it by giving them the mindset, by showing empathy, by helping them develop the tools and the skills they need to be successful at that thing, at least somewhat successful so they can feel good about it. That's your job. So find challenging things to varying degrees based on where they're at and help them stick with it, period. And when they're done, they're going to feel better and they're going to have more confidence. And then you have to tie the two up. Hey, remember you said you didn't want to uh, finish the season? Well, hey, you just had your last game and I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm really proud of you because you stuck through something for months that you didn't want to do and grown. there's grown men who don't even do that. And you're acting in a way that's going to benefit you and the people you care about and love. And you should be very, very proud of that. And they start to see that connection. All right, let's go to Jay Carlson. It's a little bit of a longer one. Okay, here we go. As men, we're supposed to be the leaders of our household. Does that mean we lead in literally every aspect or are there areas our wives should lead? Uh, there's more to this. I'm going to say first and foremost, we need to be careful of the shoulda, coulda, all that kind of stuff. Like we should lead, they should lead. Where should they lead? I, I think we're setting ourselves up for failure and I'll explain that here in a minute. Uh, he also goes on to say, my wife and I are separated. And when talking about our issues, she struggles because she says, I'm not the emotional leader of our family. And she is. I personally believe it has a lot to do with the difference between men and women uh, that we've talked about a lot here. I'm not the nurturing type and she is. I'm more laid back with my attitude where she is more anxious. I work and she's a stay-at-home mom. She has all the kids' plans and upcoming activities always on her mind and I don't. Some other things she says she needs more vague, so I won't go into those, but these are just some examples. All that said, are you guys the emotional leaders of your household? What does that look like for you? Okay, so there's a lot here to unpack. Again, you said your first question, are we are supposed to be the leaders of the household. Does that mean we lead in literally every aspect? I would answer that question. I'm trying to be thoughtful about this here. I would answer that question, yes. We need to lead in every aspect. Now, the way that we lead might be different. So for example, if we're talking about the budget Okay, well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take on the budget in my own personal household, but in other households, it might work that the wife takes that upon herself and that you need to ensure that gets done as the leader of your household, but that doesn't mean you need to do everything. So making sure things get done and making sure you do it are not one and the same. Let's remember that, okay? But yeah, if you're talking about the emotional leader of your family, I, I'm not really sure that the example you gave me equates to being the emotional leader because I, I sense some hesitation. You said it, uh, um, my wife and I are separated, but when talking about our issues, she struggles because she says, I'm not the emotional leader of our family. She is. But then you're saying here that uh, you're not the nurturing type and she is. Okay. But that, that, that really doesn't have anything to do with being the emotional leader of your family says, I'm, I'm a little bit more laid back with my attitude where she's more anxious. Again, the, uh, none of that relates to being the emotional leader. To me, the emotional leader is somebody who's empathetic, who's somebody who's understanding. You can read a scenario, you can read a situation, you can figure out what needs to be said and what needs to be done and how you're going to move forward. That doesn't mean that you need to be anxious. 
it doesn't mean that you need to, and then you were talking about her getting the kids plan. And there's just like a lot here and it, and, and none of it like leads to being the emotional leader. I'll tell you how I'm the emotional leader. Cause that was your last question in my family. Uh, and by the way, being an emotional leader doesn't mean you're always being emotional. So let's not conflate the two. Like the emotional leader isn't the one who's flying off the rails and up and down and high and low and emotion and crying and this and that because there's supposed to be some sort of emotional leader. The way that I look at being an emotional leader is being somebody who's resolute, who's steadfast, who can read what my children need from me, who can read what my wife might need, the support that she may need from me, and then doing it. And when things are uncomfortable or challenging or my wife's going through a hard time, or my kids are dealing with a situation with another kid or their own thoughts, or they're having a difficult time, then it's my job as the emotional leader to help those kids and my wife understand what their emotions are teaching them, and then basing their course of action on the lessons they're learning from their emotions. So the emotional leader is not just the like babbling, rambling, crying guy who's overly emotional and sensitive with his feminine side. No, that's, that's not it at all. To me, the emotional leader is somebody who can see that people are struggling, see that they're not, see that they're doing well, see that they're falling behind, see that they need help, being empathetic, trying to put yourself to some degree in their shoes and see where they're coming from so that you can formulate a response that's going to move the family forward in a positive direction. And by the way, also, I would say this, is you say, I'm more the laid back with my attitude where she's more anxious. Okay, you're, you're kind of talking like you're incapable of changing here. Well, I, I'm just a laid back guy. So like, she doesn't get it. So what's the problem? Okay, well, maybe you need to adapt a little bit. And she does too. I'm not telling her she wouldn't, but maybe there's some opportunities for you to adapt. You know, if she's not, she doesn't feel inspired or want to be led by the guy who's like, always like, whatever, you know, just like, whatever, it's no big deal. Maybe she would like to see a little bit more assertiveness from you. And may actually, maybe that would serve you better too. Have you tried it? Are you willing to give it a try? Or are you just convinced that you're this quote unquote laid back individual? Only you can answer that question, but it's something that you really, really ought to consider because I'm really tired of hearing from guys, not in this scenario, but guys who are like, zero F's mentality. I don't care what anybody else says. And this is just the way I am. And if they can't deal with it, that's too bad. And I'm not saying that's what you're alluding to here, but you're kind of starting to tiptoe around that line. And, and we're men, which means that we're capable of evolving, adapt and overcome, evolve, get better, improve. You can do that. You should do that. And being an emotional leader means that you're seeing, hey, my wife needs me to be more assertive in this particular scenario. I acknowledge that. I recognize that. And now I'm going to change my pattern of behavior to produce the desired result, which might be to get your wife on board, to win her influence, I should say to earn her influence, uh, and then to keep the family on track. And that's what an emotional leader would do. Hope that helps, Jay. Let me know. All right. This one is from, how are we doing on time here? We're at about 45 minutes. So this one's from Evan Berwick. How do you know when your battle plan or goals are pushing you hard enough versus pushing too hard in one area? While doing my after action review, I seem to teeter between pushing hard and being more fulfilled uh, or maintaining where I am uh, while keeping the other parts of my life balanced with less fulfillment and progress. Yeah, I mean, that, you're, you're talking about teetering between pushing hard and being more fulfilled or maintaining where you are while getting the other parts of your life balanced. Okay, so you're actually on to the answer right here, Evan. So you're talking about teetering. And, and then you use the term balance, life balance later on. So what a lot of people think life balance is, is equal distribution of resources. In, in this case, your time and your energy uh, towards all the things that are important to you. So I have 100% of my time, 25% of my time goes to my family, 25% of my time goes to my work, 25% of my time goes to me, and then 25% of my time goes to, uh, you know, charitable organizations or building my business or whatever, right? So you just, you distribute it equally. 
And that's what people think is balance. And then if they're off just a little bit, what they say is, oh, my, my life's out of whack. Well, guys, that's not really what balance is. The scenario that I've used or the analogy or metaphor, I don't know which one it is, that I've used is that if you are surfing and you're on your surfboard and you catch that wave and you pop up and you jump up on your feet, are you applying your weight equally across the board? Are you evenly distributing it? Meaning, are you putting 50% leaning forward, 50% leaning back? So you're kind of straight as a board in the, in the middle. Are you leaning, leaning to the left or the right equally? No, of, of course you're not doing that. What you're doing is you're basing your distribution of weight on what the external factors are doing. So if you're on the surfboard and the wave is pushing against you, you might need to lean left or might need to lean right, might need to scoot up, might need to scoot back, might need to put more weight on your front foot or weight on your back foot. The point I'm making is that you're going to change and you're going to adapt and you're not always going to be perfectly centered. That would work if there's no external forces, but this is life and there's external forces. There's our wife, there's our children, there's our job, there's medical illness, there's layoffs and job loss, there's uh, lawsuits, and there's all sorts of problems that you could run into. And these are external factors at play that are going to affect how you live your life and how you conduct yourself. And sometimes based on those factors, you're going to need to really, really ramp up in one area. Right. So if we're planning for an event, because somebody earlier was asking about what my plans are or what my goals are for the quarter, or the last part of the year, well, we've been really heavily involved in these events. So that means that last week, guess what I did last week? I worked probably 20% of the time, and the 80% of that time allotted was actually spent towards upgrading the barn, doing the projects around the house. And so I spent like 80% of my time doing that and 20% at work. But now that first event's over and I got behind at work a little bit. So now I'm going to be doing 50, 60, 70% at work or even more and 20 or 30 over here because the external factor has changed. And because it's changed, I need to adapt. I need to change. I need to evolve. And so you're, you're actually, the answer is actually in your question about teetering. That's right. You are teetering and you got to feel it. Sometimes you're going way too hard and you're letting everything else over here fall through the cracks and burn up. And that's a problem. And so what do you do? You adjust. And sometimes we ride our coattails. Uh, we rest on our laurels. Maybe we had a good quarter and we're like, cool, I got this. I got it all figured out. And you kind of just sit back and take it easy. Well, then you notice your income's going down and you need to ramp it back up. So what do you do? You adjust. You, you move forward. I know with me, um, diet tends to be an issue of mine, like exercise and that sort of thing is not an issue. Very, very active. Um, but I'll, I'll eat everything in sight. I love food. I'll eat it all, all day long. Um, and so, you know, sometimes I get a little heavier than I'd like to get. And when I notice that happening, I make the pivots. I change up the diet. I tweak, tweak the diet. I tweak the exercise plan. I work a little harder. I watch what I eat. I drink more water. And then I get back where I need to be. So it's this constant just moving and ebbs and flows based on external factors. And I feel like that's a more not only forgiving way of doing it, but it's a more realistic way of living life. Because here's something that's interesting. If I had a friend call me up this afternoon and said, hey, Ryan, you know, I've got this uh, incredible opportunity uh, I'm going to have, have some guys up here and they're influential guys. And I really want to connect you. And we're going to go to the lake and we're going to go uh, uh, wakeboarding. Okay. Well, I would want to take advantage of that opportunity, right? So I'm going to pivot because that's, that's important. And so I'm going to make the adjustment on the fly. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Let me shift a meeting here, tweak a meeting there, adjust my schedule, put this on this schedule and the agenda for tomorrow. And then, okay, I have a couple hours free so I can go do that. And we shouldn't feel bad about that, right? You're just reacting to external factors based on what it is you want. And that's how we do it. Again, a little bit more forgiving way to live your life when it comes to work-life balance, quote unquote, work-life balance, but also a more realistic way of doing it too. Um, another example is my dog last night has been having a really hard time with his hip. I don't know if it's a 
if it's a, an issue because it's a German shepherd, that's just naturally, you know, degenerative issue that's going to naturally take place. Or if, or if he got hurt and got hit or something, I, I don't know. Um, but this afternoon we need to make sure he's taken care of. And so like some more time and attention is going to be spent on that because that's something I didn't anticipate, but I need to need to be aware of it and involved with it. So hope that helps with the work-life balance stuff. Uh, all right, let's go to, this one's from Drew Sands. He says, did your wife always work out and take care of herself? Trying to encourage my wife to take more time for herself. She stays at home with the boys three and one. And I would like to like her to set boundaries like I do around self-care and fitness exercise. Yeah, bro, this is hard, man. Um, my wife has always been pretty good about uh, exercising, working out, taking care of herself. But I'm going to speak for her a little bit. Ladies, correct me if I'm wrong. If you see it differently, guys, maybe your experience is different. I don't want to speak for her, but I'll, I'll just make some observations. Um, my wife, who also stays at home with our four children, uh, prides herself, prides herself on being a great homemaker, being a great wife, being a great mother, being a great school teacher, like everything that she prides herself on and uh, finds joy and satisfaction and fulfillment in, it, in is all revolving around the home and, and, and us and the, and the kids. So when she leaves, whether that's to go work out for an hour uh, or she's going to go spend some time with her, her mom and her sister or her siblings, then she doesn't think that she's being a good mother or wife or homemaker. So th this is, this is the pattern that she falls into. And so we've had to have a lot of conversations about why taking care of yourself actually makes you a more effective mother. It makes you a more engaged uh, wife. It makes you more fulfilled generally, and it makes your life better. Uh, now, one thing I know that a lot of guys will do is they'll assume that their wife needs to do it. And what I mean by do it is like the self-care stuff, the same way that we do. Like I'll tell my wife, um, I'll listen to this podcast or read this book. And she's like, I don't want to read that book. And I'm like, God, oh, and I used to be so upset, you know, it'd be like a self-help book, like, uh, atomic habits by James clear. Like, Oh, you should read this like atomic habits and here, this and this and this. And she's like, I don't want to read that at all, but she'll get out a, a novel she really likes Jack Carr's books, which I think he's written, writing, writing his fifth book now. Um, or, you know, she, she'll get out something else that maybe I wouldn't necessarily read or be excited about. Not Jack Carr, because I do happen to like his series, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, and so she'll, she'll do that. And what we need to realize is that she is taking care of herself. It's, not, it's just not doing it the same way that you do it. So I've got my office out here. My window overlooks the garden and she's got this beautiful, immaculate garden. And I, sometimes I like to just, you know, in the middle of my day, just peek out there and see what her and the kids are up to. And she's got the wheelbarrow out and she's kneeling in the dirt and she's like moving dirt and planting things and picking vegetables. And she loves it. You know, like, who am I to say, well, you really should actually be doing this other thing to improve yourself. Like, who am I to say that? <laughs> she's, she's doing that. That's self-care. So Drew, what I would say, the reason I'll bring all this up is because what I would say is that you need to consider that maybe she is doing some things to take care of herself and it would be good for you to acknowledge it and to recognize it, to talk with her about it, and then to continue to foster it. So if my wife, how she really likes gardening and beekeeping, let's say, and I saw that there was a, uh, a gardening workshop this Saturday uh, at, at the community center. Then what I would do is I'd say, hey, hon, um, I, I was down at the post office and they had a flyer for the gardening workshop at the community center. And it's from nine to noon this Saturday. I actually thought that would be really cool. And also, here's another little trick here, Drew. So I thought that would be cool for you to go do. And also, I think it'd actually be really cool for just me and the boys to hang out. Like just boy, like guys time. And we're just going to go to the park and we're going to play around for a couple of hours. And then, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to go to go, go out to eat and uh, we're just going to make like a guy time of it. That's the trick. Okay. And, and I'll tell you why. Number one, you're 
you're honoring what she wants to do and for her to take care of herself. And then you're also alleviating her mental burden of thinking that her value is only tied up in being present with your boys when it isn't. I mean, it's very valuable, but it isn't only that. And so by you, what I would say, this is a, this is an extreme ownership measure here is you're not saying, Hey, don't worry about the kids. We're going to be fine. No, you're taking ownership. You're like, Hey hun, like I want some time with the boys. Like you're, you're not an, I love you. You're just not invited on this one. Cause I want time with the boys. So you do your thing. I got three hours with the boys and then it alleviates her desire to feel valuable tied up to your kids. I hope that helps. Ladies, if you want to chime in, if I'm way off base on this, let me know. If I'm right, let us know. Like this is good. This is good stuff to talk about right here because I know this is a big issue. Okay. All right. Let's go. We'll take one or two more here. Uh, this one's from Ron Inman. He says, for men who are uh, fighting to break pornography's stranglehold on their life, why is it important for them to actively be part of an accountability group and also be active in reporting not just their successes, but their failures. Please talk about the negative aspects of men isolating themselves and trying to quote unquote, tough it out through porn addiction and how accountability to self and others is necessary to win this fight. Yeah. I, I think it's, I think it's, uh, it's very important indefinitely to band with other men, to be around other men. But if you're working towards overcoming an addiction, whether it's pornography, like Ron's talking about now, or, drug use, alcohol abuse, that initially I think it's going to be the hardest time for you to overcome that. And you're going to fall into default patterns very, very quickly. If you're bored, you're going to go, you know, jump online and, and look at pornography, or you're going to get a drink, or you're going to do this, you're going to do that. These things that you're trying to get away from, uh, because you've quite literally wired the synopsis in your brain to be rewarded every time you receive that stimulus. So, uh, if you're addicted to pornography, well, you've trained your brain to give you a little bit of hit of dopamine. Every time you look at that picture or have that drink or have that smoke or whatever it is that that's your thing. Uh, and you need to rewire that. And it's really, really hard to rewire that because the brain is always looking for the path of least resistance. Uh, and it's a very, it's a very efficient tool. All things considered the brain is a very, very efficient tool. And so it's making these efficiencies. Well, when you're trying to break them of the efficiencies that they've created, and you might say, well, how can pornography be an efficiency? It's not the pornography. It's the stimulus and then the reward. And it's trying to find those things and formulate those connections. So when you're trying to break those connections, you need to have something to replace that that activity with. So every time you have an urge to look at pornography or to have a drink or to have a smoke or have whatever, then having somebody that you can reach out to, that you can connect with, uh, that you can jump online and read some stuff about, or have a couple of go-to sources, then, then what you're doing is you're actually rewiring the brain to do something different when it's looking for that stimulus. And that's why it's important. Now, Ron, you also said, why is it important to report not just your successes, but your failures, because you have to be honest. You have to be honest. There's no way to get better unless you're being honest. And if you're trying to justify or rationalize, Hey, you know, I've been really good for five days. So like just this once kid, okay, that's not being honest. And honesty stings at times when you're trying to be accountable to other guys and you're trying to hold these guys accountable. They're trying to hold you accountable and you have to report to them that you failed, that stings. And by the way, it should. Okay, we live in this ultra fragile society where nobody's supposed to feel bad about their decisions and everybody's supposed to live their, their quote unquote lived experience or, their, or, or my truth and all this kind of stuff. And so we have this really weird society where you're not supposed to feel bad about anything that you do but I would contend that there's actually some things that you should feel bad about or guilty about or upset about or, or anger or frustration or these, what people would call negative emotions. If you feel that way about it, hopefully the idea is that would cause you to do something different next time. You know, if you're on a diet 
uh, and you're doing really, really good for seven or 10 days. And then you go to Dunkin' Donuts and you buy, uh, you know, a baker's dozen of donut holes and you just like pound them down. You're going to feel guilty about that, right? You should feel guilty about that. Everybody will say, oh, don't feel guilty. You're just, oh, you, you earned it. You're, you're, re- you're rewarding yourself. You, you deserve it. But that's a lie. And it's at odds with what you're trying to do for yourself. So you're actually going to not only be fat because you keep doing that, you're going to feel shittier mentally, emotionally, because it's at, it's at odds with what you say you want. Same thing with pornography. You know, if, if, if you're not interested in that, you, you know what it can do to you. You know what it can do to your relationships. And, and, and you feel that convicted about it. And yet you still engage in the activity. Not only are you ga- engaging in the negative act- activity that's going to that's gonna hinder you, but you're also adding to that the fact that you're going to feel really bad about doing something that's at odds with the way you view yourself. And you should feel bad. And then what an accountability group or partner or whatever it may be will help with is they'll help you process that guilt or that failure so that you have a system in place to ensure that you don't continue to fall into those patterns so that you can rewire the patterns for more productive habits moving forward. That's my thought. All right, guys, a couple more here. I keep saying that. Manny Alvarez. Uh, this one's for, for, prof- for Professor Kip. I like that. He's now Professor Kip. Um, I'm going to read it here and then we can have uh, Kip answer this next week when he's back. But he says, what training outside of jujitsu do you recommend to enhance performance on the mats? Strength training, yoga seem to be the most obviously complementary forms. Do you recommend any other? So I'll let him answer that uh, when he gets back. Conditioning is another one I would definitely say in there. So you have strength training, yoga, conditioning would be an important element. And diet. I've noticed diet, even the diet I have that day uh, really affects the way I train, diet and uh, hydration. But we'll let him answer when he gets back. All right, last one right here. Austin Yardley, what jujitsu gi do you wear and what gi would you suggest for a beginner? I'm going to start training soon and I'd like your recommendations. Well, I mean, you know what I wear. I wear Origin gis exclusively um, and, and they've got them all. The, the one that I really like is, I don't know if it's their newest. It might be their second newest. It's called The Path. Uh, so if you go to originmain.com, you can check out The Path. You would click on gis and then click on The Path. I believe they have it in black, white, and blue. That's called the path. And that's the gi I like. Now, everybody who's not an origin guy is already like, no, you got to get this and you got to get that and you got to do that. That's what I wear. Um, Kip actually might suggest something different because I know he has some origin gis, but I know he wears something else typically. So maybe when he's back, we can ask him that question as well. All right. I think we got it all, guys. I've got a couple of more here, but we're going to have to save those for another day uh, because I need to get to a few other things. Speaking of balance and trying to figure out how to make sure we're making the most use of our day, that's what I have to do. So we're capping this at an hour. Uh, Again, all these questions came from our exclusive brotherhood, the Iron Council. If you are interested in that, at least watching the video, knowing what it is we do and what it's all about, then head to orderofman.com slash Iron Council and leave a rating and review, share this episode, keep on putting the good information out there, keep on asking the great questions, band with us, let other people know what you're all about, what you're doing, where you're getting this information, how you're improving your own life as a man, because they need it as well. All right, man, we'll be back on Friday, but until then, go out there, take action, and become the man you are meant to be.